Yes, now um, we will have some closing remarks. Mr. Tony Addison, Research Director for UNU New Wider. Very welcome up. What did we learn? What was the story of our day today? Well, I think the first thing we learned was that information is power. Power to affect change that protects the environment, combats climate change, supports poverty reduction. And indeed, the, the ministers amplified those points in the preceding remarks. We learned that aid is becoming greener. That's good news. The bilaterals are leading, but perhaps at the cost of multilateral action. Are they taking too much away from multilateral effort with all of its benefits of coordination? I think that's an interesting question that we leave on the table for you today, particularly if you work in aid agencies. We learned today that aid has successes. Over time, aid, the aid community has learned a great deal about environment and climate change. Investment in environmental regulations, renewable energy, and many other ways. For example, the support of donors over the years to reforms and the reforms that must come, for example, the ending of fossil fuel subsidies, as Minister uh, fries Bach emphasized. And we learned that these donor efforts work best, as our participant from Uganda said, when there is strong community involvement, and then we're going to see more poverty reduction as well, and strong government commitment. And increasingly, we've seen that work in Africa. But there are successes, but there are a lot of weaknesses. What have we got to move forward on? There's a forest of financial instruments. Um, we had one slide from our colleague from UNDP which showed a veritable uh, undergrowth, a thicket, of all of these different financial instruments that developing countries have to find their way through to get finance. And that thicket, those instruments, are very weakly rooted in the multilateral system. They're, in, in effect, not rooted well here, for example, because of the absence of effective mechanisms of climate change taxation or enough bilateral support to multilateral effort. We learned that green private investment is very cost effective and is the way forward increasingly of the future. We know that there is more green financial investment in total in climate change, adaption, mitigation, and the environment. But it's very much confined to the middle-income countries, the emerging countries, the richer countries themselves. We need to see much more happening in the low-income countries. One participant reminded us that the LICs today receive almost the same amount of private finance for these areas of concern as they did 10 years ago, and that isn't very much at all. So for them, the promises of international action of greater commitment ring somewhat hollow. And aid cannot fill that gap. The demands for climate change finance are so large. We know that get to get more private finance into the environment area, the climate change area, we have to reduce investment risk. It's investment risk that holds back the adoption of renewables in many cases, because they have larger upfront costs than existing traditional technologies of energy, energy production, such as coal-fired power plants. And renewable investment is very sensitive to the cost of capital, uh, investment capital. And so there's a great role for public action, public action at the national level, public action at the global level, action through aid, to reduce the cost of private capital, to reduce investment risk. We learned today that environmental aid and climate change finance, particularly through the Red Plus initiative, which in many ways has been an excellent initiative and is having results and impact, must learn, though, from the past, from both past aid success and past failure. Payment by results is not necessarily as straightforward as many policymakers imagine it to be. And we know that um, inducing reform through commitments of aid is not always as successful as we would um, hope. 
So in a sense, there needs to be much more of a connection between action and environmental aid and what we know from development aid, uh, past and present. We know that developing country agriculture is important for us all, not just for developing countries. We learned that. We learned that the next 50 years is particularly crucial in pushing up crop yields, as we've seen great success in the last um, 30 or 40 years. Otherwise, we will see agricultural growth coming from acreage with its associated deforestation. That's a real challenge for aid and the donor community and the developing countries going forward. We learned that green energy, energy needs to serve the poor. They are, in a sense, off the grid. <laughs> They're off the grid politically, not just off the grid from the electricity system or the water system. And insofar as we can do that, we can get them onto the grid, we can get them onto the grid energy-wise and politically-wise, we'll actually reinforce the achievement of the MDGs, which is a, a point that Minister Carlson was also making um, earlier. We learned that we need to spread environmental governance from where it is, sometimes confined, confined just to environmental ministries, which do need strengthening, but we need to have a whole-of-government approach. We need to spread it across government strategy. We need to be working more with civil society, and that will provide new opportunities for donors themselves. We learned that aid cannot save the planet alone. Aid can only be effective if it is within the context of investment in global public goods, particularly agricultural research, and in international environmental conventions and their implementation. In that regard, we need much more action around global carbon markets, the pricing of carbon, the pricing of environmental externalities that are bad for the planet and bad for poor people. And that will increase the reliability of aid, as well as providing a stream of financial resources for investment in the countries concerned. One of our colleagues, I think it was a colleague from Norway, um, mentioned John Lennon. <laughs> and um, John Lennon said many things. Of course, he said, power to the people. But actually, one of my favorite quotes from Lennon runs something like this, which is, Lennon said, living is easy when your eyes are closed, right? He could have actually said, living is easy when your minds are closed. Because yes, it would be easy if we closed our eyes to environment, climate change, the challenges that we have. If we closed our minds, some people do. Some people still conceptualize development as some sort of business as usual of 50, say, years ago, of heavy capital accumulation. Oh, we don't worry about soil fertility or yields or renewable energy, right? Close the minds, close the eyes. Well, I hope today that your eyes have been opened to some of the fascinating research that RECOM and other initiatives are producing. From the wider side, we would very much like to thank our colleagues in CEDA uh, for being very uh, good hosts um, for us. Uh, to our colleagues in Dineda, who partner with us, and CEDA, and DIS, our colleagues in DIS, uh, in the RECOM initiative. I'd like to thank our excellent moderator, Sharon, who has sustained us through the day. Our speakers who have come from far and wide. You, the audience, in the room and online in the world today. And we'd like you to invite you to learn more about RECOM at the website uh, and to read about the fascinating research which is involved not only wider, but also DIES, and over now 200 people across the world. So we come back to what Finn said at the very outset this morning. Aid is too complex a business for one person to simply conceptualize it. We need everybody's thoughts in this process, and this is what Recom is about. So thank you very much. Thank you.